Get your ears wrapped around the Golden State Media Concepts Basketball Podcast. All the scoop you need to know from college basketball to the NBA and even March Madness. News of your rising stars. Topics on and off the hardwood. This is the Golden State Media Concepts Basketball Podcast. GSMC Basketball Podcast, brought to you by the GSMC Podcast Network. I'm your host today, Nick Robin, and before we begin, I just returned from beautiful Montauk down in Long Island, and God, it was one of the most incredible weekends of my life. Unfortunately, I had to come back to reality. been sitting in my box here in Midtown, right by Times Square, and honestly, it's been a little tough to stay positive during all this time. And it's sad to admit this is probably the first time that I have full-on quarantined since March. I've left my apartment probably three to four times in the last, since Monday. So yeah, three to four times in about four to five days, leaving to get groceries, any necessities only. And it has been lonely to say the least, so I can't imagine how people... In New York did this for six weeks because it's just, well, first off, don't know many people here. So that's one reason why I've been staying put. I do have some friends that just came back from Montec as their lease came up. And just being unemployed for this long, it's really just kind of taking a damper on my mood. And I don't know, when it comes to jobs and how I feel about myself, what I'm doing for a living really reflects kind of how I am or who I am as a human being. I know that might be a little negative to say, but I mean, I think we all deal with some of the same things, but all I, all I can do is stay positive moving forward. There's 30, 40 million people out there unemployed that are dealing with the same thing that I am dealing with. So you just got to remember that. Moving forward to more positive matters, NBA is back. And on today's show, I'll discuss whether we should be worried about the Lakers' performance from last night. And since none of these seeding games will count toward the 2020 NBA awards, we'll take a look at this year's nominees. And then on Nick's picks, the five players that will become household names in the bubble. But first, a look at the return of NBA action and how long should the Pelicans baby Zion's minutes. So, after more than four months, the NBA is back. 140 days since we last saw basketball. So much has changed around the country. But four months ago, the protests hadn't started. George Floyd uh, incident had not yet occurred. And again, such a travesty. Um, On March 11th, we had 140 reported deaths from covid We are now over 150,000. So yes, it is real. A lot of people, let's not name names or parties here, but a lot of people want to think that it's not a real thing and that they decided not to wear masks at the very beginning, which made this way more dramatic and has put us way behind where we should be. New York, thank God for Governor Cuomo, has done an amazing job in minimizing the spread of this virus, and New York has somehow launched itself ahead of California and all these other states that, looking at it, should be ahead of New York, since New York, everyone's living on top of each other. Seems like a logical way for the virus to spread, but people have either fleed the city or stayed in their apartments and done their best as law-abiding U.S. citizens that they are. So the opening ceremony yesterday 
very touching, very powerful. All the players, coaches, and refs kneeled and linked their arms in unison. And John Batiste played the national anthem with a combination of the guitar and piano. And it was just so beautiful to see it. It got me to thinking that, the, I mean, obviously the majority of the NBA is African-American. The majority of the people in the bubble outside of some players and coaching staff and other staffing members are African-American. It kind of shows you that this is their chance. This is their platform to show America and to protest in a peaceful way and to continue to engrave this message into America because people are finally listening and paying attention because the NBA, by far one of the most popular sports, people are going to tune in. They're going to watch these games. Some people might not agree with some things that are said or some things that are done, but they should. I mean, it's all they're trying to do is they want an equal seat at the table. And that's what this is all about. That's what the names, the messages on the jerseys are about. And it was awesome seeing those messages from players. And um, moving on, so game one, Pelicans versus Jazz. And fittingly, Gobert, who, as we remember back in March, touching the microphones, ended up testing positive for COVID, scored the first, not only the first points game, but the last points of the first restart game. He was fouled on a dunk attempt in the final minute, went two for two from the line. Brandon Ingram went up for the three-pointer. It bounced out. Jazz get win in a game that the Pelicans needed to win. And Gobert showed up, as always, as the former Defensive Player of the Year, 14 points, 12 rebounds, and three blocks, especially a big block on Zion. And we will get into him and his minute restrictions in a sec. But looking at the game, the backcourt for the Jazz was a sign of strength there. Connolly, Mike Connolly, Donovan Mitchell, Connolly, the wily veteran who came over from Memphis after spending his entire career there, had a rough start in the first part of this season. We now have part one before COVID and part two post-COVID or in COVID, hence the restart. And they combined it for 40 points, <clears throat> 4 of 11 from 3, 10 of 11 from the strip, 9 assists, 4 turnovers, 4 steals, and 2 blocks. And Donovan Mitchell, it did take him a little time to ease his way in. He was a little shaky at first. Um couple turnovers, missing some easy shots, and if you add in Clarkson, who had 23 points off the bench, although he was one of eight from the three-point line, and looking at the box score, the Jazz honestly shouldn't have won this game. They shot only eight of 34 from three, while the Pelicans were 11 of 31, shooting close to 36%, but the Jazz... I mean, they are the four seed in the Western Conference for a reason. Stuck in there and ended up pulling this one, ended up pulling this one out of their hat. And yeah, despite some strong performances from the Pelicans, Ingram played like an All Star in the first half. He was six of eleven, and in the second half was one of nine, including that three pointer as the buzzer expired. That secured the win for the Jazz. Lonzo Ball, who people love to play with due to his unselfishness, showcases superb defense and passing ability. Seven assists, six rebounds, and two steals. Cutting through passing lanes, picking off passes. He was tremendous, but was 2 of 13 from the field, including 0 of 4 from 3 and 0 of 2 from the free throw line. So he has made great strides this year, but he's still a work in progress when it comes to the other facets of his game. And next, one of my favorite players and one of the more underrated players in the league stuck to his claim last night in Drew Holiday. Had 20 points, 9 of 18 from the field, 40% from three, hitting two out of five, five rebounds, four assists, 
three steals, and one block. And unfortunately, though, had six turnovers, which led to the Pelicans' second-half demise. And looking at one of the key fixtures for the Pelicans, Zion Williamson, the number one overall pick in this year's draft, or in last year's draft, and one of the most coveted players in recent NBA history, probably almost since LeBron James. That's how amazing and how talked about this guy is. He only played 15 minutes. But in those 15 minutes, 6 of 8 from the field, including 4 for 4 from the field in the 7 minutes he played in the first half. However, he only had, only had, did not have a single rebound and his plus minus, which is a stat we can debate all day whether there's a lot of factors that go into it. The other players on the court with you, he was minus 16 in his 15 minutes of play. And I want to talk about his minutes restriction. Why is this guy on a minutes restriction? Let's look at Steven Strasburg. In his early years with the Nationals, he was on an innings limit. He made his debut in 2010, did not, ended up hurting himself and requiring Tommy John surgery later that season. Upon his return in 2011, minutes restriction, the next year in 2012, was limited to 160 innings and unable to pitch in the postseason. 2013 was the first time that Steven Strasburg even pitched into the eighth inning. As a starting pitcher, you go out there five times a day, and your one job is to throw as long as you can and effectively as you can until your manager comes and yanks you out of the game. But this is a completely different scenario. Zion is not coming off Tommy John surgery. He's not in concussion protocol. He is a 20-year-old superstar with outside of his one injury due to the explosion of his shoe when he was at Duke, he has been completely healthy. So why rest him? He needs to get back into playing shape anyways. He is still a big, thicker individual. And what's that, And how do you get into shape? By going out and playing. And the fact that they lost on a last possession, in a single possession game, is why not throw out Zion for a minute or two? I don't think the difference between playing 15 minutes and 20 minutes is going to affect him in the long run. And these games are important. The Pelicans, as has been well documented, are only... The only reason they, they didn't go straight into the playoffs, the conspiracy that NBA people are saying all over is that the only reason that they brought out 22 teams and that they didn't go straight into the playoffs is because they want Zion to come. They wanted to see more Zion. They wanted him to come into Orlando. They wanted him to dominate. They wanted him to carry this Pelicans team into the eighth seed or a play-in game with the Memphis Grizzlies or whoever else ends up in that eighth or ninth seed. So they aren't in the playoffs yet. So why not put them out there? Why not put out your best starting five in the last couple minutes of crunch time to win a game where there's only they only now have seven games left, and they are currently four games out of the eighth seed. And looking at the standings as they stand today, they are tied with the Spurs with four games back and are a half a game behind the Sacramento Kings and the Portland Trailblazers. So yes, yesterday and every game moving forward is a must-win game. So Alvin Gentry, I understand what you have to do as a head coach. You have to protect your players. But Zion does not need protecting right now. He is 20 years old. He is not battling any kind of injury at the moment. So send them out there in crunch time, when your team needs victories. Every victory they can get. And yes, I know, I mean, hey, worst, best case scenario, they end up winning the playing game, they face the Lakers in the first round, they lose out on a lottery pick, but everyone wants to see LeBron versus Zion. So, Pelicans, let's make it happen. 
and it's not getting any easier for them because they're about to go face the Clippers, who are coming off a loss to the LA Lakers, and more to that in a sec after this commercial break. We will look into the Lakers-Clippers game from last night and whether we should be worried for the Lakers, who barely squeaked out a win against a against a Clippers team missing two of their four best players. So stay tuned. Right after this commercial break, we'll be back to you. Are you looking for the very best NFL and college football podcast? Then check out the GSMC Football Podcast. Get the latest football news both on and off the field. From the NFL draft to trades to the rumor mill to the NFL combines, they got you covered. That's gsmcpodcast.com backslash football dash podcast. Get updates on college rivalries, game day insights, and much, much more. It's football talk the way you want it. This show eats, sleeps, and breathes football. Don't forget to like them on Facebook and follow them on Twitter. Visit gsmcpodcast.com for more info. you and what a great way to start the NBA season last night with two nail biting down to the last minute down to the last bucket finishes as we mentioned in the last segment the Jazz up ended the Pelicans with two free throws by none other than Rudy Gobert the guy who got the season pause a little bit earlier than we would have liked but either way it had to happen so it is now a Rudy Gobert revenge tour, and I love it. I hope to see more of it, because how great would it be to see Rudy Gobert put this team on their back and lead them to possibly a Western Conference Finals matchup against a team we are about to talk to now, which is the LA Lakers and LA Clippers. And it has been such an amazing year for LA basketball. The Lakers and Clippers have been 1-2 near the top of the standings all year long. And the Clippers actually won the first two matchups in the season series. The Lakers have now, with their 103-101 victory last night on LeBron's missed shot putback, have made it 2-2 now for the year. And Anthony Davis came in ready to play. 34 points, 16-17 from the free throw line, even hit two shots from deep. Add in his typical eight rebounds, four assists. But LeBron, on the other hand, had himself a subpar night. Six and 19 from the field, two of seven from threes. He did add his typical 11 rebounds, seven assists, but five turnovers. However, he did show up when it matters most in the fourth quarter, where early on in his career, he was criticized for not making the big plays when he counted. But last night, Two big defensive stops in the fourth and the game-winning putback, as I mentioned. And on that last defensive possession, he forced the ball out of Leonard's hands and covered George as he attempted the three-pointer at the buzzer, which was off, and Lakers wanted it. But Leonard and George did put on a show, combining for 58 points, 18 of 33 from the field, 9 of 15 9 of 15, so 60% from three amongst the two. Five steals, three blocks. So what I'm asking is, why did they only take 33 shots? When you have LeBron and Davis, who each took 19 each, Leonard and George should each be taking at least 20 shots a game. These two guys can score from the perimeter, inside. uh, Leonard with a great turnaround jumper. And um, it just makes no sense, especially when you're missing Lou Will, Montrez Harrell, two of, two of your top four scores. You have more shots to throw around. Might as well give them to your number one and number two options, your 1A, your 1B. 
And with the Lakers, big game by Kyle Kuzma, who is a player that they really need to show up in Orlando. And hopefully, I would say this is optimistic thinking, but if Kyle Kuzma can somehow turn into a third star next to LeBron and AD, it will be a cakewalk getting to the NBA Finals and eventually hoisting that Larry O'Brien trophy. But I don't see that happening, although he was 4-7 from 3 last night, contributed 16 points and 7 rebounds, and that's what they need from him. A guy they can put at the stretch 4 or stretch 5 if need be, next to Anthony Davis and LeBron and whatever guards they can throw out there, Deion Waiters, J.R. Smith, Alex Caruso. And the turnovers were an issue for both teams, I would say, throughout the two restart games. And the Clippers, 22 turnovers, which led to 29 points off turnovers for the Lakers. And then the Lakers, though, had 16 turnovers, but minimized the damage, contributing only 14 points off those 16 turnovers. And it was nice to see... We're not in L.A. anymore, but it was nice to see the celebrity row out there in um, at the Lakers Clippers game. So NBA players are permitted to attend games in the bubble as fans. Of course, they must be six feet apart to satisfy the social distancing rules. And among those in attendance last night, we had Portland's Damian Lillard and C.J. McCollum, San Antonio's DeMar DeRozan, and Toronto's Kyle Lowry. So we don't have the typical. A-list movie stars and real estate moguls like you'd see at Staples Center, but we got the next best thing. It's like a, it's like our own AAU tournament in Orlando, like LeBron said. Been interesting so far, and really my key point to this game is that the Clippers are better than the Lakers. They've beaten them. They're 2-2, they're even, but last night the Lakers only won by two, and it took a probably one of the best defensive performances from LeBron in the last three to four years to to reel in this win. And the Clippers should be very encouraged by last night's performance. They almost won, as I mentioned, without two of their four best players in Lou Williams, who went to the Gentleman's Club and has been getting shit for it ever since, and Montrez Harrell, who had to leave for a family matter. And the bench points last night only... Managed 31. Their 2019-2020 season average is 51. So that's 20 points that they basically missed. Uh, Lou Will averaging 20 a game. Harrell averaging 18 a game this year for the second seeded Clippers. Kawhi also committed two offensive fouls. First time in his career led to him sitting out nearly the entire first quarter. And looking at the overall numbers... The Clippers beat them in every statistical category. All the major ones. Rebounding, they out-rebounded them 55-53. to They outshot them. They both shot 36 threes. The Clippers made 16 at a 44% rate. And the Lakers only made 11 at a 31% rate. Overall, they just have a more balanced, deep roster that can throw multiple lineups at you. They can go big with Zubak, Morris, George, Kawhi, and Landry Shamit. They can go small with Montrez, Paul George, Kawhi, Lou Will, and Beverly. So they can throw a lot of different things at you that the Lakers more or less cannot. And looking back at the stat sheet, I mean, realistically, they beat them in three-point percentage, overall field goal percentage. The Lakers shot under 40%, still managed to win, but again, missing two of your four best players, you should probably have a little bit easier time against the Clippers, although they still have their two best players in Kawhi Leonard and Paul George, two of the best wing defenders in the NBA. Now, looking at the next big storyline from last night, Anthony Davis came out, was being fed the ball most of the game, LeBron was feeding him, and it begs the question... Is Anthony Davis now the best player for the Lakers? And I know it's only been one game, and we shouldn't blow this out of proportion, but that's what we do here in the media world is we take a small sample and we beat it down 
and come up with all different scenarios from that small little situation, even then, though it's one meaningless game, which for both of these teams, well, not really in the Clippers' case, but in the Lakers' case, they could have lost this game. They'd be fine. They're now a half a game away from clinching the number one seed in the Western Conference, which, as we know, this year doesn't mean shit because they're playing in an empty fucking arena with no fans and we don't have that real home court advantage. Nonetheless, it's still good to be number one and to come out with a victory against a team like the Clippers. But back to the question at hand. So is Anthony Davis now the best player on the Lakers? I'm going to have to say no. In seven years with the Pelicans, he only made two postseason appearances. He was there seven years, which gives you time to develop a team around you and try and win, which on occasion, more than likely, he didn't. The only times he did make the playoffs, the first occasion, OKC um, barely missed out because Durant only played 27 games that entire season. He was out with a leg injury. As we remember, that's when Westbrook got into that triple-double mindset that really never left after that season. And then in 17-18, they made it into the first round against the Portland Trail Blazers, but I would say they came out victorious more due to Holiday and Rondo neutralizing Portland's guards. So it was more on his team than himself that they advanced, ended up facing the Warriors, got swept or lost in five games like everyone did over the last five years. And then he, yeah, he, so really he hasn't proven he can win in the postseason. This is still LeBron's team, and this team will only go as far as LeBron takes them. Not saying Anthony Davis is an important piece, because of course he is without Anthony Davis, this team is a 4, 5, 6 seed. But without LeBron, this team is an A seed borderline lottery team. So it's still LeBron's team. Despite the poor performance from last night, it's just one game. Let's see how he bounces back from that when they play Toronto next game, which is honestly could be a finals matchup with Toronto having lost Kawhi Leonard, have barely lost a step, and are looking in at the number two seed right now in the East, and have the postseason experience to go after the Bucks, who, as we know, Middleton and Bledsoe have been less than impressive in their postseason careers. And now looking at the tale of two players that the Lakers brought in, Deion Waiters, J.R. Smith. J.R. Smith, eight minutes, 0-1 from the field, whereas Deion Waiters, 11 points, 5 of 10 from the field, although he was only 1 of 6 from 3, but he was 4 for 4 from within the arc. And on top of that, was a team high plus minus plus 17. Again, that stat can go either way. It doesn't really mean jack shit, but if anything, it's more of a good thing than a bad thing in this case. But the unspoken hero of the night and someone we're going to see a lot more of as we continue in the bubble, Alex Caruso. So the Lakers have lost Avery Bradley, unfortunately, as he declined to come to Orlando. And then with Rajon Rondo, injured himself, will be out six to eight weeks. So that gives Alex Caruso one of the few guards left on the team ample playing time. So last night, and I'm going to go into a little comparison here with another player who plays for a rival, the Lakers and the Celtics, and that would be Marcus Smart. And Marcus Smart and Alex Caruso, although they'll have some blunders at times and maybe you don't want them shooting that three, they do at the end of the day make winning plays. So Caruso last night played 28 minutes the fourth most he's played in a game this season. He was only 2 of 7 from the field, 3 of 6 from the free throw line, 4 rebounds, 2 assists, 1 steal. Not a great stat line by any means, but that 1 steal was a huge play in the final minute that would have been the game-winning defensive play if not for Paul George's 
berserk of three-pointers at the end. As he did tie the game, LeBron ends up missing the shot, getting his put back. The Lakers get the victory. But Alex Caruso is just the type of player you want on your team. You love to root against them, and you hate to root for them. So that's the type of player that can pay dividends in this long, extended playoff run for the Lakers. But we'll just have to see about that. Now, moving on, as I mentioned earlier in the show, all the stats from the seeding games will not count towards this year's NBA awards. So after this commercial break, I will dive into the all-NBA teams, first, second, and third. I would have gone with all the normal awards, such as MVP, Rookie of the Year, but those seem locked up, and I feel like there's a lot of great candidates for the All-NBA teams this year, especially with the strikes-shortened season that we've had to deal with. So after this commercial break, All-NBA League teams, stay tuned for that. Check out the show that's built on the MMA. From the UFC to extreme cage fighting, they got the fights covered. Check out the GSMC MMA podcast. Get the latest news on past or upcoming fights. Join us as we talk to and about some of the biggest names in the MMA, past, present, and future. When it's the fight game, there's just one show to check out. GSMCpodcast.com backslash MMA dash podcast. Don't forget to like them on Facebook and follow them on Twitter. Visit G. GSMCpodcast.com for more info. And now it's time for one of my favorite things, analyzing players and seeing how they've done throughout the season. And it's been an interesting one, to say the least, as we're all looking at a 60-ish, 60 to 63 game sample rather than a typical 82 game um, sample size. So I think, either way, I think after three-fourths, more than three-fourths of the season being behind us, we should be able to make the same amount of logical picks for who should be on the first team, who should be on the second team, who should be on the third, and so forth. So starting with the first team, and I'm going to go a little positionless off of uh, some of these picks here, but I'll try my best to keep it within a guard, guard, forward, forward, center matchup to keep things typical. And uh, on the first team, no surprises. I would say many of these are not surprises at all. First off, we have LeBron James, and this, if elected to an NBA first team, this will be his 13th time, which is two more than Kobe Bryant and Karl Malone, and breaks a tie with Bryant for the most all-NBA team appearances. So, right there, I mean, he's not yet has the six championships like Michael Jordan, but, I mean, this has to say something that he's still in his 17th season being elected as a top five player in the NBA. It's unprecedented. We can use all the verbiage and descriptive words we want here, but LeBron James is all time. He's at least should be in everyone's top five. And he's led a Lakers team to the best record in a tough Western Conference. Yes, he has had the addition of Anthony Davis, who we'll get to in a bit, but Without LeBron, this team is barely a playoff team. Because as we've seen and as I've spoken about earlier, Anthony Davis had his chances seven seasons, seven full seasons in New Orleans to lead that team to some kind of playoff dominance, and he never did. So this team, this Lakers team without LeBron and just with AD is, I'd say, not much better than the Pelicans team he was on last year. 
So LeBron, I have at the first guard spot. Next spot, James Harden, who's averaging 34.4 points again. Unfathomable. We didn't think he could take it to another level after last season. And at one point, he was averaging nearly 40 a game. This will be a six-first team, would be a six-first team, placing him seventh all-time for guards. And we have to start in the conversation that James Harden might be the second greatest scorer since, well, the second greatest scorer outside of Michael Jordan and Will Chamberlain. But scratching Will Chamberlain, he might be the second greatest scorer since 1980. Michael Jordan, and then it's James Harden and Kobe Bryant. And James Harden is just, I mean, he already holds his third all-time in most consecutive 30-point games. Kobe never did that. Not even Michael did that. So that's got to speak for something. So James Harden's the second guard on the first team. And then Kawhi Leonard, who surprisingly, this surprisingly would only be his fourth all-NBA team. He came over from the Clippers in free agency, teamed up with Paul George. Although Paul George and Kawhi have only played about 30-ish games together. Kawhi has been the catalyst for this team, um, leading them to the number two seed in the Western Conference. Although he, had, he does have more help than I would say a couple of the other guys on this list. But nonetheless, the Clippers are not vying for a number two speed in a spot. Of their first ever appearance would be their first ever appearance in the Western Conference Finals. Now, looking at the next pick, Giannis Antetokounmpo, which is a no-brainer. He will more than likely win... The MVP, once again, making him a back-to-back winner and leading one of the most dominant teams in league history. I believe their fifth all-time in points per game differential. So that speaks for itself. And he's been even better than he was last year, scoring nearly 30 points a game on only, only 31 minutes of playing time. He's increased all his numbers across the board and leads in every advanced statistical category that I'm not even going to start to get into here. But the guy's the best player in the world, plain and simple. He just hasn't proven it yet. So let me take you back there. He is the best regular season player in the NBA as it stands today. And then at the center position, although he's... Played more at the four with JaVale McGee and Dwight Howard taking it over most of the minutes at the five. Anthony Davis, who has not disappointed in his first season in L.A., posting near career highs in points per game. And even has developed an outside shot, which is something that you have to develop when you're playing around a player like LeBron. He turns all fours into stretch fours, i.e. Chris Bosh, Kevin Love. So... Anthony Davis, Giannis Antetokounmpo, Kawhi Leonard, James Harden, and LeBron James are my first team All-NBA. Now, those were, I would say that first team, a lot of those were no-brainers. These guys were going to be the top votes getters for MVP, but now going into the second team, it took a little bit more decision-making, and we start with, I'm going to start with our two, the two guys that just missed out on the first team, and that is Nikola Jokic, who after a iffy start, posted his typical 20-10 and 7 from the center position and led the Nuggets into that three seed range and have the ability, although those these stats don't count towards the all NBA teams, will have the ability to overtake the Clippers for the number two seed in the Western Conference. And then our breakout player, and honestly could be in the discussion for most improved player, even after winning Rookie of the Year, Luka Doncic, has led a surprising Mavs team into the middle of the pack in the Western Conference. And although, again, it doesn't count, last night had an awesome game against the Rockets, although they slipped up at the end and lost in overtime in one of the highest scoring games of the season. And then now it gets, those two picks were automatic because those guys were on the cusp between the first and second teams. And now looking at some players that could have slipped between second or third and looking in none other than Damian Lillard, whose team has been, I would say, disappointing this year after making a run to the Western Conference Finals. 
a lot of front court issues with players such as Zach Collins and Yusuf Nurkic missing time, but it hasn't slowed him down as he's posted career highs in points per game and assists. And to be honest, I think Damian Lillard is probably one of the most underrated players in the NBA. This guy does not get enough credit. I mean, just look at the performance he put on after the death of Kobe Bryant, came into the Staples Center and blitzed him for 40 points, took away a win from a Lakers team that really needed a moral victory that day. He not only dropped 48 points, but had a near triple-double with 10 assists, 9 rebounds in what should have been LeBron's show that night with the death of his good friend Kobe Bryant. But that just shows that Damian Lillard is a bad man. The guy is an assassin, doesn't get enough credit where credit is due, hasn't tried to chase rings, has been dedicated to staying in Portland. And a little story I heard is this guy is as homegrown as they come. When he comes to play the Golden State Warriors, he takes the bar to the Coliseum, walks over to the stadium, just like you and me. That is that and alone just epitomizes who Damian Lillard is. Big fan. And honestly, wish we could see him succeed a little bit more this season and see him in the playoffs because I think he would be a great first round matchup against the Lakers team because the Lakers have no one to stop Damian Lillard. The one weakness the Lakers have this year is their guard play is mediocre at best. And then over to the next guard spot and someone who's had the ball out of his hands last two years but has been re-given the keys back to the engine with Chris Paul and Oklahoma, playing for the Oklahoma City Thunder this year. And everyone thought it was going to be a lost year for Chris Paul, that his career was over, that he was being stuck with the Oklahoma City and what was left after Russell Westbrook and Paul George ditched town. And what he's done is led them surprisingly to a fifth seed in the Western Conference, been one of the most clutch time performers this year. And yes, there's a lot of credit to give to the three-guard lineup with Dennis Schroeder and Shai Gilgis-Alexander and Billy Donovan at the top. But again, Chris Paul, he's the engine, he's the catalyst. They don't go without him. They don't go anywhere without him. And impressive for a six-foot, 35-year-old guard who we thought was past his prime. But, hey, he's being he could be voted a top-10 player in the NBA this season. And the numbers, I mean, they're not... They don't blow you off the board, 17 points, 6.5 assists, not his typical norm. But what he's done for this franchise speaks volumes to who he is as a player, and it'd be great to see him get past the second round this year as well. And lastly, um, on my second team, Jimmy Butler. The first time he has made the Heat relevant for the first time since LeBron left in 2014. We're talking nearly six years ago. He's posted career high in assists at 6.1, and his shooting has all but evaporated, but he's been a consistent offensive force in the paint, averaging right around 20 a game. And they they made it to the fourth seed in a very top-heavy Eastern Conference. If we look at the standings, you have Giannis and the Bucks up top, followed by the defending champion Raptors, the Celtics, who, in my opinion, are possibly the most talented, on paper, talented team in the NBA. They come in at the four seed ahead of a Sixers team that features two All-Stars in Ben Simmons and Joel Embiid, and right ahead of the fifth seeded Pacers, who have also had a surprising start. And um, there, there you have it, my second team, Damian Lillard, Chris Paul, Jimmy Butler, Luka Doncic, and Nikola Jokic. Now... Moving on to the most controversial team, and that is the NBA third team. And we have, I have Bradley Beal at my first guard spot. And yes, I know, this team has been awful this year. It is an embarrassment that they were even invited out to the Orlando bubble. But that was all because of Beal. Unfortunately, he's out for the year. But he averaged over 30 points a game for the shortened season that we've had. 
only that has only happened 70 times in NBA history. I'd say Jordan and Wilt Chamberlain probably account for 10 to 12 of those times. So he's one of probably only 50-ish, 40, 50-ish players that have averaged 30 points in an entire season. So you got to put him in as a top 15 player in the NBA. Yeah, his defense might be a little lacking, but the guy puts on a show every night. Next guy, Russell Westbrook. This might be a controversial pick, as, and we'll get into these snubs in a sec, but he's adjusted his shot selection in the second half, making him one of the most dominant paint scorers. He's been good and as, as of late has been great, leading the Rockets in the Western Conference with the two-headed monster of him and Harden. And then one of my favorite players in the NBA, Chris Middleton. He was one made field goal away from 50-40-90 on one of the greatest teams in NBA history. Only nine players have accomplished that feat. Eight players in the NBA. He defends four positions for the league's number one defense. And this stat was mind-boggling to look at. So when Giannis sits out, he averages 31.4 points per game per 36 minutes. Pretty impressive for your number two player. And then at the last forward position, and one of the rising stars in the NBA, on one of the most talented teams, Jason Tatum. Last year, he kind of took a step back with Kyrie Irving in town, but this year he's bumped his average up from 15 to 23 points a game. He's been a stellar defender and the best player on one of the best teams in the Eastern Conference. And he's only going to get better from here. And then lastly, one of the more unpopular players maybe right now in the NBA or was Rudy Gobert. He's averaged 13.6 rebounds, a career high, and shot 70% from the field. And has played at his typical old defensive level, which has been even tougher this year as the Jazz have decided to add in more firepower of Mike Connolly and Bogdanovich and have gone away from the defensive minds that they've kept. And they've now been, they're now 10th in the league in defense, which is their worst mark since Rudy Gobert became a full time starter. But he is the leader in defense, real plus minus, for the fourth consecutive season, which is a player's estimated on court impact on team performance, measured in points allowed per 100 defensive possessions. And on top of that, he leads the league in screen assists. He has 443 besides Dominis Sabonis, who has 430. He has 100 more than the, than the third guy, than the guy after Sabonis, which is Bam Adebayo. That leads us into the, stu- the stubs, and there are a couple big ones here. Kemba Walker, who is playing on a winning team for the first time in his career, and he has been a great point guard in comparison to what Kyrie Irving brought to the table last year. Devin Booker is still one of the best young guards in the NBA, but his team just can't seem to win. Whatever he tries, we thought we saw the resurgence in the beginning. He was 12-10 and 10 or 12-11 and 11 in their first 23 games, and we thought... He's finally putting it together. The Sun are finally going to make the playoffs, but more than likely, it doesn't look like that's going to happen this year. And then Bam Adebayo, who's been one of the most versatile defenders, a point forward, similar to a LeBron, can guard all five positions, can bring the ball up the court. But I'd say Rudy Gobert was a little bit more impactful to his team, especially with the losses of some of their better defensive players. Trey Young, Average 29 and 9, which honestly should put him at least in the conversation for a top 15 player in the NBA. But his team was just so awful, and himself on the defensive end, just no good. So he gets cut. Ben Simmons, and Ben Simmons was probably my toughest pick here. It was between him and Russell Westbrook. But the 76ers, they just haven't performed this year. They're 39 and 26 at the break, and they're not much better than they were last year, and we had high expectations for them. They're still not able to space the floor the way they would like. But and Ben Simmons, his performance, if you look at his numbers, are the same exact as they were last year when he did make an all NBA, all, all NBA team. But I just think Bradley Beal scoring 30 points a game 
is something that we don't see often. You had to put him ahead, and Russell Westbrook, being one of the best players and one of the best teams in the league, you have to give you have to give that to him. And then lastly, Joel Embiid, he's missed way too many games to be in the consideration, but even with his what some people say lack of effort, still putting up 23, 24, and 11 a game. And then lastly, the number two seed in the Eastern Conference, Toronto, they needed to have a representative, Pascal Siakam, but it's just Chris Middleton and Jason Tatum have just, I think, been more impactful and had better seasons than Siakam, so he barely misses the cut here. But if he continues to produce like he did and develop like he did this past season, he'll definitely be making an all-NBA team in the near future. So there you have it, my third and final NBA team, Bradley Beal and Russell Westbrook at the guard positions, Jason Tatum, Chris Middleton, and Rudy Gobert. A lot of first-timers this year. And now moving on to Nick's picks after this commercial break, I will talk about the five players that will be household names once the bubble is over. Stay tuned for that. Check out the show built around the women of MMA. From the UFC to the extreme cage fighting, we got the fights covered. Listen. It's the Golden State Media Concepts Women's MMA Podcast. The latest news of upcoming fights, discussions of previous matches. Join us as we talk to and about the biggest names in women's mixed martial arts, past, present, and future. When it's the women's fight game, you know where to listen to. The Golden State Media Concepts Women's MMA Podcast. And with the whole world on pause, sports world has all eyes on the NBA. So today on Nick's Picks, we are looking at my five players that I think will be household names or are going to make, basically they're going to have their coming out party in Orlando over these next weeks to months, depending on how far their team makes it. A couple of these players are already on their way to becoming established stars, but I think with everything going on in the world, all eyes will be tuned in to these players, and the whole world is about to find out how great they are. So the first player on my list was a budding superstar before he injured himself, missed 18 months, no pun intended, is getting his feet back underneath him. Chris Taps Porzingis, he looks like he can be that 1B to Luka Doncic's 1A over in Dallas and honestly could be one of the best duos we've ever seen. The guy's seven foot three, can stretch the floor, uh, can guard multiple positions. He's just the type of player that you want in today's NBA. You can put him at the five, you can put him at the four, you can even put him at the three. He blocks shots, he rebounds, he shoots he could potentially be a 40% three-point shooter. The sky is the limit, and it's taken him a couple months, but he's really come on strong as of late, uh, especially before the shutdown of the season. The guy put up three consecutive 30.10 rebound games in January and February, and put up another con- uh, consecutive 30.10 rebound games in March as well. So, Chris Porzingis, number five on Nick's picks list of players that are going to make a big impact and become household names in Orlando. Next, at number four, Jonathan Isaac. And this guy, he's not just a walking protest right now with how he decided to stand up, not wear a Black Lives Matter shirt on Friday in Orlando's tip-off against 
the Brooklyn Nets, but the guy can really play. He's a stretch four, can shoot, can similar to a lot of the players we see, can play multiple positions, and was having a breakout season before he suffered an injury back in January. Hasn't played since January 1st, and really I think if... Orlando is going to make the playoffs and make a run, he's got to step up. So, Jonathan Isaac, Florida State alum, and one of the most, I think, underrated players in the NBA. Moving on, number three, Jalen Brown. And he came to the league, people said he wasn't going to be able to shoot. He's turned that around, similar to how Kawhi Leonard and many others have come into the league with, without having a shooting touch, but what we've seen is with the right amount of repetitions and practice, it can be done. Jalen Brown is part of that Jason Tatum, Kemba Walker, Gordon Hayward, four-headed monster, and really this season, he's already shown that he can be one of the best two-way players in the NBA, and I think those who don't walk, tune into too many Boston games don't know too much about him. Went to Berkeley, very under-the-radar move. Came out, was the third pick overall. And th- as of late, the guy has played lockdown defense. And I think he's only, at 23 years old, he's only going to continue to get better. Number two, OJ Ananobi. There's a reason that... The Toronto Raptors have not taken a significant step back from where they were last year because this guy put him into the Kawhi spot. He guards your best player. Uh, His offensive game is still a little rusty, but that's coming along as well. But he's a lockdown defender. He'll guard your best player. He won't hurt you offensively. And the Raptors are the two seed in the East. And yes, Pascal Siakam has... Taking his game to another level like he did the year before in winning the title. But it's not all about Siakam. Uh, OJ Ananobi, another great wing defender. Which brings me to our last player to watch for in the Orlando bubble. And that is Jason Tatum. Before the end of the season, he was having a monstrous march. Averaging nearly 30 a game. And he has only gotten better with the departure of Kyrie Irving. It is now his team at only 22 years old. Him and Jalen Brown form one of the best young duos in the NBA. They find themselves in the third seed right now. It's going to be interesting to see what happens moving forward because, honestly, they have the talent and the team to take down the Bucs. And I think it would be great to see a Celtics-Lakers rivalry. It's not the rivalry of old with guys like Kobe Bryant, Kevin McHale, Larry Bird, Magic Johnson, Paul Pierce, Kevin Garnett. And there's not that same kind of intensity, but meeting in the finals might add to that kind of rivalry. LeBron, though, actually has a lot of experience or a lot of bad blood between him and the Celtics franchise, but all those players that he played against are retired, and it's crazy to see that in 2020, LeBron is still playing at a high level. I remember in 2012 when he put up the 45-piece in the go uh, win or go home game. So I think the whole NBA world would take a lot of joy in seeing a Lakers-Celtics finals, and it all starts with this guy, Jason Tatum. So that's all we have for today on Knicks Picks. The five players to watch out for, Chris Tapps Porzingis, is Jonathan Isaac, Jalen Brown, OJ Ananobi, and Jason Tatum. These guys are the future of our league, and it's great that we have all the time in the world right now to sit in front of the TV and watch them go to work. I want to end the show with talking about how great it is that the NBA is finally back. We've been waiting 140 days, nearly four months, or over four months, to watch the sport that we love, and it has been nothing short of amazing so far. We've had great games already. The first two games of the season were nail-biters to the last minute, 
And I think this is just the tip of the iceberg. We have a lot more basketball coming at you. So stay tuned for my next episode, the GSMC Basketball Podcast. As always, go on, follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. Leave us a comment. We'll really appreciate it. And until next time, guys, continue staying positive. I'm out. You've been listening to the Golden State Media Concepts Basketball Podcast, part of the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. You can find this show and others like it at www.gsmcpodcast.com. Download our podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, and Google Play. Just type in GSMC to find all the shows from the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network from movies to music, from sports, to entertainment, and even weird news. You can also follow us on Twitter and on Facebook. Thank you, and we hope you have enjoyed today's program.